Hello and welcome back to my channel and welcome back to the great outdoors. I am here in sunny, sunny Dartmoor today and uh, yeah, it feels like a long time since I was last out for a camp but I'm here, as most of you know, to give the Nortent Vern 2 its first outing in my care. So I'm hoping to find somewhere fairly exposed here on Dartmoor today. We're going to give it a little bit of wind, a little bit of rain I think. The forecast thunderstorms seem to have disappeared so fingers crossed I don't get zapped in the tent tonight. But um, yeah, it's going to be about a four and a half mile walk I think and about two and a half hours and I'll get pitched up and make my little home for the night. I'm about 1.5 miles into my walk now and I'm right out in the open moor here in Dartmoor. I've really missed this place actually, I haven't been here for quite a while. So if I just show you around a little bit, we've got High Willays up here, which is the highest point on Dartmoor. We've got Yes Tor up here. We have West Mill Tor over here and Row Tor just out of sight, almost across the back there. Straight ahead of us, we've got Black Tor, which is a spot I have camped at before. And uh, I'm really just keeping an eye on the weather at the moment because you can see we've got various patches of blue sky, white sky, grey sky, and I've had just a few spots of rain in the last couple of minutes. Looking at the sky though, I could see I didn't really need my waterproof on because it's just a, a very light shower passing over. But I am not too sure what the weather is going to be saying once I get to the first sort of potential camping spot. So this place, as I said, straight up ahead. This is Black Tor. That is a possibility for tonight. I quite like the idea of going up to the highest point on Dartmoor to try out this Nortent Vern 2. But um, yeah, I'll be guided by the weather a little bit. Also guided by the way I feel a little bit. I'm quite flat today, really. I've spent weeks just kind of sitting around trying to rest uh, what I thought was a dodgy knee, but it turned out to be a, a hamstring tendon issue. So. Still babying that one a little bit, it's not right yet, but um, it's good enough to let me come out today. I wear a Fitbit watch, so I checked my readiness score. The Fitbit gives you a readiness score out of 100 each day to tell you how ready you are to take on the day's activities. And my score today was 17, so that kind of explains why I'm not rearing to go. But I really had to kick myself out of the door today because I knew I wanted to be here. I really want to try this tent out as well. But you know what it's like when your energy levels are low, you haven't had the best sleep, and although you'd love to be sitting on top of a hill, you know it's going to be a bit of a slog to get up that hill. In my penultimate video, I was looking at my winter pack weight, so you can see my Osprey Atmos 65 on my back. I weighed all of the kit I've been taking on my winter camps, and even with my lightest four season tent it was coming out at just over 21 kilos so the tent i have on my back today is five kilograms which definitely isn't the way i wanted to be heading to try and lighten my pack weight but i'm just out here to try this tent really it's not going to be a regular tent that i use but i've done some sneaky packing and i've managed to make this pack lighter than my previous weight so even though I'm carrying a two-man heavy-duty four-season five-kilogram tent on my back, this pack is actually just over two kilograms lighter than my previous camp. And I'll talk about that a little bit when I get to camp. I'm going to be trying out another new piece of gear on this camp as well, and that is a new head torch. Thank you to the people of Army Tech in Germany for sending this head torch to me to try out. This is going to be the first time I've used it so I'll give you a quick look at it when I get to camp. I'll have a very quick chat about it and um, yeah I'll be using it over the next few camps and seeing how I get on with it. A 
I've just stopped for a couple of reasons. I've got a little bit of rain coming in now, so it's a good time to get the waterproof on. But what I'm also going to do is collect some water from this little stream here, because one of the ways I've cut out a whole load of weight from my pack today is by bringing only half a litre of water with me, which is just to hydrate me on the walk. And on the previous, on the winter camps, I've been bringing around about two and a half litres of water, so that's two and a half kilos of weight. So I've saved two kilos out of my pack today by chopping two litres out of the water I'm carrying. But what that does mean is that I need to collect some water now. So I've got my Cenoc Vecto two litre water bag here. I've also got my Soya Mini water filter. So I'll collect the water, carry that with me for the rest of the way, and then I can filter that and cook with it later. Here comes that rain. I'm here at the first potential camp spot. This is Black Tor. And this area just here looks like it would be big enough and just about level. I'm also going to go up to the higher section here and see if I can find anywhere up there to put a tent. The rain is just starting again. I think that's going to be the story of today, really. Showers coming in, although I can see quite a heavy patch of grey cloud over there now. And the wind is coming from that direction. So chances are the rain is going to stay for a while now. Look at all of that rain coming in. You can see the sheets dropping down all over Dartmoor. I've been looking around up here at uh, Black Tor. I've decided I think I'll carry on a little bit higher, so I might even end up right up on the top. Uh, level with the highest point on Dartmoor at High Willhays at this point. It's only about a quarter of a mile away, so it won't take too long to get up there. It looks like that weather is going to hit me. I mean, look, we've got blue sky right there and then torrential downpours over there. The rain is coming from over in that direction, so... I don't know. Seems inevitable I'm going to catch some rain. But hopefully I'll be pitching the tent within about a quarter of an hour. So fingers crossed we miss it. By the way, if you're here just to see the tent and you're not really too bothered about the rest of my camping adventure, I always use chapters in my videos, so if you want to skip forward to something of more interest for you, feel free to use those chapters, and I'll see you wherever you click on next. I have finally decided on a spot, so this is High Willows behind me, the highest point on Dartmoor, 621 metres, so if I show you some of my views, you can see that you've just about got a 360 degree view all the way around Dartmoor. You can't quite see down the bottom there, but if I were to stand up by the cairn there, right up on the top, I would be able to see basically the whole of Dartmoor. So it's a, a really dramatic place to stick a tent. And I've found a fairly flat and reasonably level pitch just here. So I think it is time to get the Nor tent Vern 2 pitched and then I can get this kit off and uh, start to relax. Anyway, let's get this tent pitched. So this is the Nor Tent Fern 2. I've packed it in one of my dry bags today and uh, I'll flash up the size of this dry bag on the screen. It's one of my Exped bags. It's just about fitted in here. I could really have done with a bigger dry bag but this will just mean that I can compress the tent down a little bit so it takes up a bit less space. And also when the tent is wet in the morning, I can pack it away in here. It just prevents all the moisture from the tent leaching out into the backpack. It's just starting to rain and I can see a lot of rain coming in. So I'm gonna make this as quick as I can.
Okay, so as you can see now, I've got the pole structure up. I've started to clip the tent itself to the poles. But what I'm going to do now is get some of these guy lines fastened out. And that just means that it's uh, a little bit more stable if the wind picks up. You can see that I've only half built the tent, so the wind doesn't have too much to catch. Of course, I've pegged all of the tent out around the bottom. And tents like this, let me wipe that off a little bit. Tents like this are really good for pitching in foul weather just because you can partially build it up before the wind can really catch it and try and blow it away or bend anything. So I'll get these guy lines out and then finish pitching. Okay, that is all of the clips in now. As you can see, we are getting a pretty good rain test today. I started getting the guy lines that were going to help us in the wind pegged in. You can see I haven't tensioned these yet because I hadn't clipped all of the clips onto the poles. So you don't really want to have your guy lines tight. Otherwise the tent won't be able to take shape properly. So now the tent is all clipped in. I'm just going to go around the bottom, make sure all of the pegs down at the bottom here are in the correct positions. They look pretty good to me. I'm just making sure that the fly sheet is all nice and taut everywhere. You can see this section here is flapping just a little bit. So I think these two pegs need repositioning slightly, but otherwise it's looking really good. And the tent is roughly aligned with the wind direction because the wind is coming from up over there. So we are nearly there. I don't think I'll film the rest of the pitching because all I'm going to be doing is adjusting the pegs and putting the guy lines in. I'm getting pretty wet now as well. So uh, in a few minutes time, I'll be inside the tent and we'll take a look. The weather has kindly given me a little bit of a breather, which is very nice. If I pan around, you can see that massive curtain of rain that's just passed over us. And if I flip around to where it came from, that sky is actually now clearing out just, uh, just below the cloud there. But because the weather's cleared, it gives me a chance to show you this pitch. So this is the Nortent Vern 2 in its natural habitat, right up here at 621 meters on top of Dartmoor. And uh, I'll show you what's what. So straight away, here's one of the end vents. And what I can do is, just excuse me a second, clip that up onto the guy line. What I was going to do is actually leave that unclipped because I don't really want the, the rain being driven straight in through that vent. It's quite tricky to do with one hand. So let's have a look around. This vent seems to be falling shut a bit. I'm not quite sure why that is. These have, oh, there we go. I think I'll just, there's a little ribbon here that stiffens it and that had just twisted. So all it needs to do is twist back into shape and it holds itself open like that. All of the guy lines are up now. I've used an individual peg for every single guy line. I think it would be possible to use a single peg for two guy lines just to save on pegs if you wanted to. Really, really love these Nortent stakes, by the way, the really heavy duty things. No danger of those bending under your foot. Um, so again, we've got the vents, the two ends of the tent are symmetrical. And what I have found, I'll bring you around actually to this side, is that this zip didn't really want to stay shut. But then I saw that we've got the storm flap here, which uh, just prevents the weather from blowing straight into your zip. That storm flap is on a band. And if we follow that through, that comes out at this pegging point. So this strap pulls on the storm flap there. So if I loosen that off again on the buckle this storm flap then becomes a bit loose and i think what that actually does is maybe doesn't hold the zip shut quite as well at the bottom of the door 
So that zip had ridden up a little bit. And what I don't really want to do is to be taking the strain of the tent pitch on the zip. But I think tensioning this band helped with that just a little bit. I'm not really sure yet. This is my first time pitching this tent out in the wild. So I'll pull that tight again. And that keeps some tension between this point and that point. It, it does actually just take some tension off the zip there, which is a good thing. So that's just a fairly little detail I noticed. Once again, I struggled to reach the, the clip right in the top centre there. But uh, that is not the end of the world. And this tent looks really, really good, doesn't it? Let's just stand back and have a look at how good that looks. Mimicking the shapes around Dartmoor as well. I do like the logo on the door there as well. Nice and simple, nice and subtle. Doesn't stand out, it's not garish. But you can see it's pitched really nice and taut. And I don't think I'm going to have to worry about that caving in the wind tonight. What a beast. Okay, that's enough of a look at the outside of the tent. I'm gonna get my kit here, put it inside. I really need to get dry and warm. Here comes the rain again, so I'm going to get some hot food on the go, I think, and I'll see you in a sec. Straight away, I can see what people have been talking about with this tent, so the rain runs straight off and drips down here onto the, I've got a, I've got the footprint attached to my tent here today. But yeah, here you go. You see that it's all just kind of running down and dripping in. Now I know that some people, including Andrew Park outdoors, um, Andrew, ugh, yeah, that's really just raining in now. Andrew has fed this back to Nortent. Nortent are having a look at the design of the tent and seeing if they can have a bit of a gutter along here, I think, and that will just channel the water down and it can run down the pole rather than dripping straight in on you while you're trying to keep dry in your vestibule. It is so, so helpful having this much space. I can fully stretch my arms out in here. And when you're soaking like this, what I find in my smaller tents, like my little Terra Nova Southern Cross one, which is a true, really small, compact one-man tent, I find it really difficult when I'm soaking like this to try and get undressed and get dry and everything and just everything on the inside of the tent seems to get wet. But when I've got this much space I can get my wet clothes off. I can splash a bit of water around in here but I've got space to move around, mop it all up and then I can get my gear out. I can get my sleep mat out, I can get my sleeping bag out, I can change my clothes and I'm just going to have acres of space. You can see I'm kneeling up in the tent as well. and. Uh, yeah, I've got drying lines here as well if I want to dry some kit. If you haven't seen my video where I took a first look at this tent, where I just pitched it out in a, a quiet spot in the countryside, I'll leave a link to the video in the description of this video. But uh, yeah, this is my first use. And I guess for me to assess whether or not it's waterproof, I'm going to have to mop up all of my water in here first. So I'm going to get out of this wet stuff, get into dry kit and get some food going. I had to bring you back for this. I've just taken my waterproof jacket off. Time to get my trousers off and I can actually stand up in here to take off my trousers. And that's something I have never been able to do in any of my other tents. Ah, oh, that just makes everything so much easier. So I've got lots of water all over the, the ground sheet now. I've got a cloth here. So I'm just gonna make sure I dry everything up as I go. And that way I can try and keep the inside of the tent nice and dry. My trousers have stayed quite dry underneath my waterproofs, which is really good. So once I've got this dry in here, this can remain a nice dry space for me to get my sleeping kit out. I've also brought my down trousers with me, so I want those to stay nice and dry, of course, because down does not insulate very well when it's wet. Anyway, just thought I'd show you the fact that you can stand up in here to get changed. I've got things dry now, so I've got my trousers over here, got my long sleeve t-shirt over here, long sleeve top. Slight oversight, I accidentally packed two pairs of thermal leggings instead of one pair of thermal leggings 
and the thermal base layer for my upper half. So I've got a micro fleece hoodie on and my Rab Cirrus hoodie just to keep me warm. I've got a hat on as well, which makes a really big difference. I've also got my all important down trousers, which I absolutely rave about. As you'll know if you've watched many of my videos before. Uh, so all I need to do now really is get my sleep mat inflated, which will take no time because as always, I'll be using my Flextail Tiny Pump 2X. So I can just plug this in, fire it up, let it go, and it takes two minutes to inflate my Thermarest Neowear X Therm mat. If you'd like one of these, there's a link in the description and a discount code to get 15% off. So I mentioned that I managed to save a whole five kilos out of my pack weight compared to my usual winter pack list. So my sleeping bag is a big part of that. The temperatures have warmed up a little bit now. They certainly won't be below zero Celsius tonight. So I'm in a slightly cooler sleeping bag tonight or a slightly less warm sleeping bag, should we say. So this is my Big House Elevation 600. This was, I think about 95 pounds, maybe four or five years ago, something like that. And uh, this sees me down to around about five Celsius, give or take. But because I got my down pants on as well, I should be okay down to, I don't know, maybe two or three Celsius, something like that. So this sleeping bag is about 500 grams lighter than my Rabascent 900, which I use for my cold weather camps. What I've also done is I've left my drone at home, that's another 800 grams. I've left my little digital thermometer at home, that's about 100 and something grams. I've left my little monocular at home, that's again, that's about 170 grams, I think, something like that. Uh, I told you about my water, so I left, uh, I brought half a litre of water instead of two and a half, so that's another two kilograms saved. I've brought dehydrated meals only on this one. Oh, I didn't bring my little fire maple gas lantern. Um, that's a bit of a luxury item really, so I left that at home. But yeah, that, that's the bulk of it really. The drone, the sleeping bag, the water, and then those the little bits and pieces that add about 150 grams each. So chopped about five kilos off my pack weight. And then of course I added in about three kilograms by bringing this absolute beast of a tent. I was really keen to bring it out and give it a go in, in nature, so yeah. I was quite keen to chop out some weight where I could because this is just, it's a really solid, solid two-man tent. The fact that you can pitch it in high winds, really bad weather, you've got an absolute plethora of guy lines all the way around, the really heavy duty guy lines as well. And that's something I do miss on some of the cheaper tents or the really, really lightweight tents. As soon as you start losing guy lines from a tent, you really start losing that structural rigidity of the tent. So you're really reliant on the pole structure and all the pegs around the base of the tent. So my Hilleberg Solo has 12 guy lines on it. So that means I can really anchor it to the ground and that tent has withstood over 50 mile an hour winds with me in it. This thing, uh, let me just count up how many guy lines we have. We've got two, four, six, 12, 13, I think we have 14 guy lines on this tent. That's a hell of a lot of guy lines and obviously you've got a whole load of pegs all the way around the edge as well. I think this tent comes with 24 pegs or stakes, the, the great big Y section stakes. And I've had to bring four additional ones today and that's to peg out the bungees. There's a small bungee on each door. Uh, so I thought I'd bring some extra stakes to get those pegged down as well. So this thing is really just, it's it becomes part of the earth, I think, when you pitch it because it's it's really anchored down. I'm really impressed so far. So this tent, as sturdy as it is, it seems to lend itself more to being a sort of base camp tent. Or you've, I've actually had someone comment on my previous video where I took a first look at this tent. He lives in New Zealand and he has a, a great big four-wheel drive. So he goes off overlanding into the middle of nowhere, parks up, and he wanted one of these tents. So he's ordered himself a, a North Tent Burn 2. He will just chuck this out when he's in the middle of one of his adventures into the middle of nowhere. He's got a nice sturdy, spacious shelter then for the night and then he'll pack it away back into his, his four wheel drive and he'll head off onto wherever he's going next. So it's not necessarily the ultimate lightweight backpacking tent for two people. I definitely wouldn't say it's a, a backpacking tent for one person. Obviously I've brought it out here today and I brought the, the optional footprint so the whole lot does weigh in at five kilograms just under and uh, that's not going to be the typical use for this tent, just your solo backpacker who wants a bit more space. I'm loving having this much space, but I, I would not be looking for a five kilogram tent 
to go camping with them on my own typically. So this tent is going to be more for a kind of base camp setup where two of you would trek out, get this pitched and then it would be a base to go off walking from for maybe two or three days. Um, maybe also if you're into really hardcore heavy duty winter camping this is the type of thing you would take with you that it is going to stand up to the elements and maybe you'd pull it on a sled because it, it does weigh quite a lot you're not going to want to go backpacking up and down too many mountains with this on your back my walk today was about 3.8 miles as I say I'm actually quite used to carrying over 20 kilos on my back but a lot of people don't want to carry more than about 10 or maybe even 15 at a push so for a lot of people they're not going to want all of this weight on their back because every step you take and every meter you gain in elevation having more and more weight on your back really starts to take its toll in terms of the energy you burn all your joints your feet your shoulders so it's always good to keep your weight down low if you're going to be doing lots of trekking and particularly when there's lots of climbing involved. Well I'm already talking a lot more than I wanted to. My uh, The first video I released on this tent was way longer than I wanted it to be just because there's so much to say about it and I find it quite hard to be brief when I'm talking about this stuff. So um, yeah I'm gonna get this food on the go which I think I've said about three times now and I'll stick my head outside and see what the weather's like as well. Here's tonight's menu. I'm trying a new meal I've never had before. I've never had any fire pot food yet, but this is the chili con carne with rice, adventure food pasta bolognese, which I have had before and I know I like, and also the adventure food mousse au chocolat, which I definitely like. And since yesterday was Easter Sunday, I have a little lint bunny as well, which I'm really looking forward to actually. Uh, so I've got my breakfast there. It's just a bag of pre-mixed cereal. And this is that water I collected from the river earlier, so I'm going to run that through the filter now and get some food going. I was just about to light my stove, but my lighter appears to have given up. It's releasing gas, but it's not really sparking. This is, I think, the first time I've actually had to resort to using my backup lighting method, which is a little fire stick I've got here. So you just give it a bit of a scratch and it pops out a, a little spark. So let's give this a go, haven't used this for a while. There we go. So, that's the stove fired up. I've just filtered a bunch of water, so let's get that heated up nicely and get dehydrated meal number one on the go. It's really handy having these two doors actually because you get a real through draft in the vestibule so you don't get all the steam necessarily purely coming into the tent, some of it can just blow straight out. And this vestibule is a really really useful size and of course you get one that side as well through that door. It's uh, a mirrored tent so it's the same on each end. My meal's warmed through nicely now so it's time to get down off these rocks which have these really handy built-in steps. Thank you, Mother Nature. And I will go and grab my long-handled spoon <coughs> and dig in and see what this meal's like. See, that looks a lot like chili con carne and rice. Looks like I maybe didn't put quite enough water in, that's because I was being very slightly stingy because I don't really have excessive amounts of water today. Mm. Yep, that's a winner in my book. Sometimes you try a new meal and straight away you just think, what was I thinking? I'm never buying this again. But this is really good actually. Look at all that moisture just building up on there. Same on the top of the tent as well. And you can probably see the moisture blowing in towards the camera there. So when people talk about some tents being really bad for condensation, you do have to consider what the conditions are 
uh, the sort of atmospheric conditions as well because right now with all that moisture blowing past the camera you can tell that it's just going to fill the tent with moisture as well so if there is a, a moisture build up in here it's partly going to be down to the ground i've got the ground sheet in here that needs adjusting as well handy little strap here pull that tight you can pull this tight over here as well it's probably not very easy because i've got my rucksack on here and everything but um yeah it's nice and adjustable but um yeah you can see that there's wetness all over the top of here because I've been walking in here with my wet shoes and clothes and whatnot so this will gradually evaporate up in the tent. I've also, I don't know if you can see, got my clothes in there drying still so uh, they're going to be filling the interior with moisture as well so tricky to judge how good or bad this tent is with condensation but given that it's got a vent at the end here, a vent at the other end uh, you can unzip these doors from the top as well just to give you some airflow through the top and you've got mesh doors here if you want to open up the solid yellow fabric you've just got some mesh so that will obviously flow air really well as well you couldn't ask for much better ventilation really to be honest on a, a four season tent as well I'll just give you a quick look at the Armitech Wizard C2WR head torch so here it is connected to its head strap which has a circumferential band and also a band that goes over the top of your head to keep it really stable and there is a little rubber clamp here that holds it into its its little bracket here but I haven't used that yet it seems quite stable and then you can just pull it out and use it like a little torch so it's single button operation pretty short it's got a replaceable rechargeable battery in there which uh, recharges via a little magnetic cable so that is another cable you need to remember to bring with you it doesn't have a, a sort of a standard USB-C cable or anything like that and yeah it's a German company pretty easy to use so far it does what I need it to do it lights things up uh, it's nice and small it's rechargeable and thank you to Army Tech for sending this to me I'll get to grips with this over the next few camps I'm sure and because I haven't mentioned it yet, also, this tent was sent to me free of charge by Nortent. So uh, I did mention that quite a lot of times in my first overview video when I, I showed you my initial pitching of this tent. But I haven't paid for it with my own money, but that's not going to blur my opinions. I'm going to tell you everything I see. Uh, for example, the doors where you can unzip the top of the door for ventilation. The top of the door then flops down, but there's nothing to, to hold it in place. So I'll be interested to see if I notice those flapping around in the night. It might just need a little elastic tie there so you can hold it in place and you don't have flappy noises. You can hear there is some wind in the air tonight. The rain's just started again as well, but the tent itself is quite quiet, which is exactly what you want. I've just opened the inner door down the opposite end of the tent. I haven't really been using this end, I've only been using the opposite end. So, as you can see, I haven't been walking in and out of here. I haven't opened these doors today. So I thought I'd check some of these seams, because these seams aren't seam sealed at the factory. Of course, Nortent provide you with seam seal in case you want to seam seal. But, what I have noticed... I'm having to look really hard for these. Uh, that's one there. There's one minuscule little droplet where my fingertip is. I don't know if you'll even see it, but there's basically one droplet has come through that stitch. So if I wipe it, yeah, that's gone away. There's one there as well. And I saw one. There's one. If you can see that, just where my fingertip is. I don't think it's going to come out very well on the GoPro. It's just there. And there are a couple of drips just coming off the... Um, that little bit at the, the end of the zip there. I think I can see some moisture that's come through, yeah, just there. So I'm not sure... That's probably come through the zip backing material there where it stitched through to the sill nylon. So on all the main seams, like this one up here, these have four layers of fabric, which is why they're basically watertight without being seam sealed. But I'd say that this one is just the zip fastened directly onto the sill nylon. So it looks as though a tiny bit of moisture has come through there. It's just dripping off the end there. So yeah, we've got some drips down there, which I presume have all come from that. Something else I can show you, if I take the GoPro away, 
These little zippers are glow in the dark, which is really, really useful actually. Just looking to see if I can see any other evidence of water making its way through. I can't see anything anywhere really. So those individual droplets are all I've seen and as far as I'm concerned, I can make peace with that. So Nortent say that you can seam seal it if you want it to be 100% waterproof. You can see a couple more just in here as well. I don't know if you're going to be able to see these, but basically they're individual sort of microscopic droplets of water that have come through what I presume is just the that tiny, tiny hole where the stitch, where the needle breaks through the fabric, where it pierces. It's then filled up with um, expanding thread, so the thread expands when it gets wet to fill that hole, but it looks like tiny bits of moisture can just about make the way maybe down the thread and then through that little pinprick hole and then it's just sitting there. It's not sort of running down the inside of the fly sheet or anything. I don't, I don't really have an issue with that. I'll be really interested to see what other people think. I know some people are getting um, a little bit emotional, should we say, about the fact that this tent doesn't come seam sealed, but you get provided with some seam sealer if you want to seam seal your tent. So I think some people expect the manufacturer to do that for you and they feel a bit shortchanged. Um, I think we all know that for a manufacturer to seam seal a tent just completely screws up their, their production line because you have to seam seal and, and then leave them out for about 24 hours. So to have the tents pitched and just sitting for 24 hours will just completely cock up all of your, your manufacturing process. So there are reasons they don't do it. Um, personally, I don't see those tiny pinpricks as a good enough reason for me to seam seal this tent. I uh, Let me look down this end as well. I don't know if those drops there have come through the open door. They are right next to the seam so, so it could be similar. There's another one right there. I'm really having to hunt for these. Interesting, there are one or two spots like this where it looks as though the water might have come through from outside. It's hard to tell. I can't really say I've inspected a tent this closely before because as long as it's not, I don't have water pouring into the tent, then I'm generally quite happy. I'm out in the outdoors. I expect there to be a little bit of weather coming in and out. Right, here we have another drop. I don't know if you can see that. And there's one here as well. But um, I d actually, when I got the tent out, uh, when I was pitching it, this section of the tent, um, before I'd fully inserted the poles and everything, this was hanging and it was actually holding a, a sort of trough of water because I hadn't clipped in the, the clips onto the poles at that point. So I wouldn't be surprised if if that maybe impacted this section of the tent. It does feel damp on the inside, but then like I say, the whole tent has basically been filled with moisture because I'm up in a cloud now. I'm at just over 600 meters of elevation. But yeah, I, I don't have any dramatic observations to make at this point really, apart from the fact that it's really quiet in the wind. You can see that the tent is, is taking some wind, it's flapping around a bit. I'd guess that we're at about 15 miles an hour again, but uh, yeah, the tent is nice and quiet. Anyway, unless anything else happens in the night, that's probably going to be all for me, and I'll see you in the morning. Good morning everybody, it's just after 7 o'clock and I've had my breakfast now and I thought I'd just share some thoughts with you about my first night in the Nortent Vern 2. So the wind didn't really let up all night, it hovered around the sort of 10 to 25 mile an hour mark, mainly 10 to 20, it, it wasn't really all that windy last night. 
but this tent is really quiet. That's my, my overarching impression, really. It's very strong and very quiet. I'm a really big fan of an aerodynamic tent, one that can sort of cut through the wind rather than just being hit by the wind. That creates a lot of stress in the tent. It also creates a lot of noise. So the fact that this tent is quite wide gives it some sloping sides and then from the ends as well they're really sort of tapered up so the the wind rides over the tent rather than battering into it and creating a load of noise. On my Hilleberg Solo I tend to find that makes quite a lot of noise even down at sort of five to ten miles an hour because it's got a little separate top hat that fits on top and that really rustles in the wind. Uh, I did wonder if the tops of the doors where they just fold down so you can unzip the top of the door and let it drop down to get some airflow. I did think they might flap around but I think the, the hood over the top of each door prevents that from being a big issue so they weren't noisy like I thought they would be. Well I was lying here this morning, I woke up at about five o'clock, I've had about four and a half hours sleep, something like that and uh, I just found myself looking around the tent really and it really struck me that the inner tent is really taut, it's really well supported by the outer tent. Um, I did notice over this side that the inner tent is touching against the fly sheet so I'm not sure if that's just the wind blowing the fly sheet in or if maybe I've done something wrong there. It might be that I've over tensioned the inner and pulled it too close to the outer on this side so maybe the two need evening up a bit with the tensioning straps, not quite sure. Uh, something I have noticed, if I spin you around, you can just see a drip of water on this bungee. This bungee allows you to, when you've unzipped the door, you can tie it back along here and down at the bottom. Uh, I've just knocked that drip off there, but a little bit of moisture coming through there, and it's the same down the other end as well. And that's something Andrew Park mentioned to me. So Andrew Park from Andrew Park Outdoors channel on YouTube. I think he was the first person really to do any rain testing with the Vern 2 and the Vern 1 when they were launched recently. Uh, so he just left them out in the rain to see how they fared. And I think that is the only point. So there are, there are two bungees on each side at each end, each end. So there are eight little bungees there. And he found that some water did just creep through there. So it must be where the bungee is stitched through to the main seam. And he's just added a little dab of seam sealer on the outside just to prevent water leaching through and then dripping into the, the vestibule there. I did find, I showed you on the, the door down at this end, that's the sort of wind facing door tonight or last night. I showed you where the zip seemed to be leaking a little bit of water through the fabric that holds the zip, if that makes sense. So i um, not too sure about that. I'd like to do a bit more testing of that, maybe take it out for another windy camp and see what happens. I don't know what you'd do about that really because I don't think you would seam seal the zip fabric. Not too sure, I'll ask Nortent about that and see what they think. But otherwise I've just seen one or two little pinprick water droplets that have come through the seam but they haven't gone anywhere, they haven't been dripping in or streaming down the inside of the outer tent or anything. So as far as I'm concerned this tent doesn't need seam sealing. I think some people think, well, if you pay hundreds of pounds for a tent, it should be 100% waterproof. Nothing should get through. But, um, yeah, maybe that would be ideal, but I, I really don't have an issue with one or two mini droplets just sitting there on the seam. That's not causing me any issues. Um, it wasn't the wildest night. There was sort of 20, 25 mile an hour wind, like I say, and a fair bit of rain, and I've been in the cloud all night, so visibility is... Uh, maybe up to 50 meters now, but I, I've just been in a cloud, so the tent has been fully cloaked in moisture all night. But um, the inner is still properly dry. Like I say, there's this little bit over here where the inner is touching the outer, so I can see that there's some, yeah, there's a little bit of moisture transfer right there where they're touching, as you would expect. But otherwise, it's it performs really well in terms of ventilation because it has such good ventilation. You've got the four door vents, two end vents, couldn't be any better really. You might be able to see there's a little bit of moisture here on this door and that's because with the door open up here, I had the top of the door open all night. The wind was getting blown in a little bit so it's just been flicking over onto this door. So on this side where I had the vent open, the back face of this door is wet and then on this side where I had the outer door shut, this side of the inner door inner tent door is dry so 
it's just a function of the rain blowing in because I had that door open quite a lot on this side. I do like how big these doors are. They give you a really big view out. I actually didn't shut this door at all last night. It was wide open all through the night. Um, but yeah, I imagine once you got both of the outer doors open and this great big porthole inner tent door open, you'll get some really good views outside. There's nothing to see today because it's so cloudy. But um, yeah, I really like that. And because they're porthole doors, they're nice and easy to operate as well. One hand operation for the most part. So yeah, I am a fan of those. I'm a fan of the whole tent. I've really enjoyed this actually, but uh, I'll try and keep my talking to a minimum because I've talked a lot on this video. I was going to try and keep it below half an hour, but there's no way. But um, yeah, drying lines have been handy, but my clothes are still soaked. So I'm going to get myself packed up and I'll have a quick chat with you before I finish up. I just came for a look around this side of the tent. This panel here is where I found the outer was touching the inner. It's really not the end of the world and I think you kind of have to expect the outer to touch the inner at times. The point down here could be maybe slightly further over. But I mean the wind is hitting us from this side anyway. It's, this panel's bowing in a little bit so these two panels here are taking the wind so it's not really a surprise that we've got a little bit of contact there I don't think. Just coming around to the outside again so these toggles here correspond with the little bungees on the inside where we saw the water dripping through so I think what Andrew Park was saying is that he's run some seam sealer down there I don't know if he can maybe get some underneath as well but really just to stop the water permeating through these stitches here and then hopefully it won't get through to the bungees on the inside same goes for these down here so perhaps run some seam sealer down there. But does this tent ever look good? It's, I know the aesthetics of a tent aren't that important. You really want it to work well, but this tent looks really good. It's got a real military feel about it. I don't, I guess the color is part of that, but yeah, the black and the green, it just looks like it means business. And you can see it is moving a little bit in the wind, but it's so quiet because you've got really good tension on all the panels and the shape of the tent just means that it, it deals with the wind loading. So particularly these two longitudinal poles, if you've got wind coming in on the end here, those, of course, these poles go all the way down to the far end and they sit in their pockets at the far end. So any force in here is just dealt with immediately. You don't really have too much flexing of those poles, I don't think. But uh, yeah, first impressions are very good. the tent partially disassembled. I've taken one pole out and even though there's a bit of a breeze you can tell that because the tent is not fully clipped up to the full height of the poles the wind doesn't have too much of an effect on the tent. I've still got guy lines attached so if I wanted to minimize the pole movement I could just keep these tensioned a little bit and then you can see that the tent is slightly anchored against the wind here. But as soon as I disconnect these guy lines, or rather I unwrap the guy lines from the poles, the tent will be allowed to drop a little bit more again. And then that just means that there's less area for the wind to hit. So now with those guy lines unwrapped from the poles, the tent's dropped a little bit more. And you can see it's quite calm now. So now is a good time to get those poles out and then we'll get the tent all rolled up.
I've got the tent all packed up now, as you can see. It fits in that dry bag just about. I could really do with a bigger one, but the only size I have that's the correct size has got my sleeping bag in. So I had to make do with cramming it into this one, but it does the job. And something else I wanted to comment on actually was these poles. So it's something I didn't really think about when I gave my initial overview of this tent. So you'll see that the very ends of the poles are red. The rest of it is gray. And then you have a red pole section at the end. And the same goes for the blue and the back black poles as well. And I found that was actually really useful when I got all of the poles out of the bag. Of course, they're all in their folded sections. So you've just got a mass of poles. You don't really know which end to start from. And uh, yeah, just having the end section only colored means that you can just reach straight for the end section and then start connecting the pole together from the end. It just helps you untangle that mess. But it's time just to do a quick check around where I was camped. So this is where I was. And we have two steaks left over here. These are really meaty steaks. I like these a lot. But that concludes my very first use of the Nortent Verntu. And I would say it's been a roaring success. I actually didn't think I would use this tent much more than sort of showing you guys what it looks like, how it feels and the general quality and performance of it. Just because it's so heavy with the footprint it's five kilos, without the footprint it's four and a half. But actually by taking those measures to reduce my pack weight before this camp, I didn't really notice the difference of the extra pack weight and obviously the goal would be to have a really, really light pack. So by having five kilos of tent in it is an additional around about three kilos on top of what I need to carry for a tent for myself. But to have all of that space was a real bonus. And I think this is possibly the strongest tent I own now. So it would be on my mind if I, if I was heading out in really, really strong winds, this would be my first choice now, I think, out of all my tents, just because it's such heavy duty. And um, yeah, it just it really cut through the wind a treat last night. I didn't really, well, I mean, that didn't test it at all. It was 20, 25 mile an hour gusts and that, that tent didn't budge. It was not challenged at all. So thank you to Nortent for sending it to me to try out. It's an absolute beast. Thank you also to Army Tech for the head torch. I'll show you a little bit more of that torch on my subsequent camps, but for now, it's, it's doing exactly what I want it to, so I'm really happy with that for now. Time to get packed up and walk back to the car. My parking runs out at 10 a.m. and I don't really want to have to pay another five pounds for half an hour. So thank you for watching this one. If you feel I've missed out any details on this tent, please let me know in the comments, but also look back to my previous video where I ran through some more of the sort of finer details of the way the tent goes together. But uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I will answer those. If you would like to follow me on any more of my camps and look at any more gear reviews like this one, hit subscribe and you can join me on future videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.